thank you very much and welcome uh, everyone to this uh, event in which we'll uh, discuss David Walsh's uh, book, The Priority of the Person. This event is uh, sponsored by, and I wanna welcome everybody on behalf of the Institute for Human Ecology uh, at the Catholic University of America, uh, an institute that educates students uh, to give the Republic its best citizens. That's uh, our aim and to sponsor multidisciplinary academic research on the intersection of human flourishing and Catholic social doctrine and to order events encouraging conversation between the academy and the public square. And there've been many uh, events uh, like the one we have today, uh, excellent events over the course of the, uh, the last uh, couple of semesters and there will be more. Uh, and today we also uh, are beginning with, with this event really to introduce a new program uh, at the Institute for Human Ecology, uh, an initiative on Catholic political thought. Uh, the Roman Catholic tradition has a deep vein of thinking about political institutions and practices, starting with the very early development of political theology in thinkers like Augustine and the medieval incorporation of Christian uh, political thought through the Aristotelian tradition in the work of Thomas Aquinas and uh, e even the second scholasticism, authors like Vittoria and Bellarmine and Suarez, rekindled by Leo XIII in the Thomistic revival and the development of modern Catholic social doctrine. And of course, the 20th century of thinkers like Jacques Maritain and Yves Simone and John Courtney Murray. This is a great a tradition that we think is underappreciated and we're working to leverage resources to develop new ones, uh, to offer uh, courses and training for students and to disseminate this tradition of thought to, to a country that we think uh, needs it. So uh, this is the first event uh, that this uh, program is sponsoring, but please uh, uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll have a lot more to say about it um, uh, in the fall. Uh, and there really is no better way to begin a, a program like the one we have uh, than to talk today with, with especially with David Walsh, uh, who's uh, really one of the most uh, remarkable and accomplished uh, political theorists uh, working today and one of the treasures of the Catholic University of America. Uh, Professor Walsh uh, holds a doctorate from the University of Virginia. He's taught at the University of Florida, at the University of South Carolina at Sumter, and at the Catholic University of America really for the last uh, uh, over 35 years uh, now. Uh, he served as a department chair and as interim dean of the School of Arts and Sciences. Um, uh, uh, and uh, he's the author of eight books. Uh, most recently, the one that we'll talk about today, uh, The Priority of the Person, uh, which was published by the University of Notre Dame Press in 2016. And just prior to that, uh, he, uh, a few years uh, previous in 2008, um, uh, he published a book called The Politics of the Person, uh, and before that, uh, a major work from Cambridge University Press on the modern philosophical revolution, but as I say, uh, eight books um, altogether. And it's also a privilege to have uh, as a guest today and as a, a, an interlocutor with David, uh, John von Hiking uh, from the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, a very fine and accomplished uh, political theorist there who uh, holds a doctorate from the University of Notre Dame He's taught at the University of Lethbridge uh, for over 20 years, has served as acting chair of his department and been a visiting professor at the University of Rikyo in Japan and also at the University of Köln. Uh, professor von Hiking is the author of three books, um, a book called Politic, uh, Augustine on Politics as Longing in the World, published by the University of Missouri Press in 2001, The Form of Politics, Aristotle and Plato on Friendship from uh, 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 McGill Queens University Press in 2016, and a book called Comprehensive Judgment and Absolute Selflessness, Winston Churchill on Politics as Friendship from St. Augustine Press in 2018. And so it's wonderful to have, uh, to have Professor von Hiking here uh, with us today also. Uh, the way our program is gonna work is we're first gonna have some uh, opening remarks uh, from Professor Walsh, where he talks about his book, and then a conversation between Professor Walsh and Professor von Hiking. And then about 2.40 p.m., we'll open things up to questions uh, from viewers. And uh, you can type those into the Q&A box uh, at the bottom and then uh, we'll field those uh, around 2.40. So for now, uh, I give the floor to, uh, to David Walsh. All right, uh, thank you very much, Brad. And uh, let me just uh, express my deep appreciation for your initiative in uh, starting this program in Catholic political thought. 
uh, and especially to uh, Joe Capizzi and the Institute for Human Ecology uh, for getting behind it and uh, really supporting it. Um, one of the extraordinary things about Catholic University and uh, my uh, time uh, there has been the number of uh, good colleagues and good friends that one makes across different departments. So it's wonderful to have joint participation by people from uh, not only the Department of Politics, but also the School of Philosophy and the School of Theology and Religious Studies, amongst others. Um, this is really um, a, great, a great venue or a great forum for these interdisciplinary conversations. And uh, we've been very, um, uh, I think, um, uh, fortunate to be able to sustain a good number of those conversations over the past few years since the Institute for Human Ecology has uh, been uh, initiated. And so I'm, I'm glad to see uh, a focus on uh, political philosophy, political thought, and its connection to the Catholic tradition uh, now become uh, part of that you know, many, many uh, pronged operation that the Institute has. Uh, and I'm very, uh, much, I very much appreciate uh, my friend John Van Hiking uh, taking time, uh, uh, getting up slightly earlier on, uh, in Alberta for this conversation, not super early, but that's still <laughs> manageable. Uh, and um, you know, being, being prepared to, to enter into this conversation, John and I uh, have known one another for a good number of years, especially through our uh, joint interests in the work of Eric Vogelin and all of that. Uh, but also um, uh, increasingly convergent um, professional studies on um, classical political thought and on um, friendship, and naturally that overlaps with the person. <clears throat> um, and I'll uh, maybe just say, if I, I don't want, you know, I, 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 my, my inclination in these, on these occasions is to just say a few brief remarks and then uh, enter you know, engage robustly in the conversation and the dialogue. Um, and I um, anticipate good questions also from our um, uh, viewers on the webinar. Um, the, the title of the book, Priority of the Person, essentially means two things. Uh, one is, you could say, the obvious one that um, <clears throat> the person uh, is prior in political matters and in, and in terms of the value, the centrality uh, and the infinite worth and dignity uh, of each person, uh, that, that that's a pivotal principle for organizing politics, increasingly recognized today and certainly increasingly embraced by uh, the Catholic Church, its teaching and to the whole Christian tradition. Um, so, uh, you know, that I want to, it's, it's the, when you prioritize the person, you prioritize the rights and dignity of all human beings. Uh, it has another connotation though, which I would like to draw your attention to, and it's perhaps a little less obvious. Um, and that is that um, the person is um, someone who speaks to us from, in a sense, before they exist. Uh, if you think of, this has been one of my important philosophical insights over, over, over the last decade or so, especially arising from uh, my work on the modern philosophical revolution. And uh, some of that is alluded to in this, in this, in this, in this particular volume. But uh, the idea that uh, the person who speaks is not the person uh, from whom the speech arises. Uh, but that the person is prior to all that is said. Uh, St. Augustine had this insight uh, too, and it's in his Confessions where he uh, has a famous remark. He says that um, uh, uh, the per uh, uh, you know, a man or is, is uh, so deep, the depth of the soul, the depth of a human being is so deep as to be hid from him in whom it is, that we are deeper than we ourselves can plumb. And obviously his own Confessions, uh, which is the sort of uh, initial book in terms of reflecting on what it means to be a person, uh, arises out of that realization, out of that perception. And I'm not sure it's been fully absorbed within the tradition uh, that 
the person is in some sense, I'm, you know, only, I'm only saying that in some sense, prior to being, prior to existence, coming from beyond, from beyond what we know. The very origin of the term for the person, I think, comes from uh, the Greek prosopon, the mask or the persona, uh, uh, the, the, uh, which is again the same idea, what is carried by the actor. And so there's a kind of visibility, a presence, but then there's also something that's prior to the presence, before the presence, something that's hidden. The person is in a sense hidden, even from ourselves. Uh, and that's something that uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll chat a little bit about. Uh, obviously, all of this means that uh, the person is a difficult category to discuss and to deal with. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, even though focus on the person is a modern and a contemporary development, and there's a famous school of personalism that really begins with German idealism, comes out in the 19th century. And uh, we have wonderful exemplars of it in the 20th century, the most famous being Karl Wotia, John Paul II. Um, so even though there is a famous, um, uh, you could say, intellectual stream of personalism, um, I'm not convinced that uh, we have fully mastered even the language of the person. Uh, and I'd like to make you know, whatever contribution I can to advancing that, consolidating it, and um, you know, bringing it into the real world. Uh, one of the important, as a political philosopher, one of the important things for me is to um, connect what I'm doing with the world of politics. Um, the person uh, uh, is of course a central, category, a central category in a legal and a political sense. Uh, and it's almost only in that uh, uh, connection that the term person has really survived. It's not really been kind of a technical term from uh, the classical Greek world. Uh, and even in the scholastic world, uh, uh, it really surfaces mainly in theological contexts and you know only peripherally in relation to human persons uh, so it, you know it's been you, you could say there's a there's a sense in which uh, despite the fact that we are all persons despite the fact that being a person is central to our conversation and to who we are and everything else that um, there's a there's a sort of inaccessibility to the very idea of who we are and of who we're engaging with when we enter into conversation, debate, and dialogue with one another. And obviously this intersects with the political, I think, in important ways, including debates about uh, who is a person, um, the definition of a person, uh, criteria for personhood, all of those things, as well as the entitlements, the rights, the responsibilities, the dignity of persons. Um, you know, those are all, that's entirely, I think, a language that has, uh, that is still in the process of development. And uh, uh, we, uh, you know, have a project uh, in working with it and thinking about it. And that's essentially what I've, what I've tried to do. Uh, I did publish an earlier book called Politics of the Person as the Politics of Being, which was intended to be my kind of um, comprehensive statement about it. And, um, that's obviously uh, probably the, the, the um, uh, important benchmark in, in, in my work. This, this particular book, The Priority of the Person, was in many ways a bit of an afterthought because after I'd done the politics of the person book, I thought, well, you know, I have a lot of essays that I produced along the way <clears throat> that were not part of the book and I ought to really kind of pull them together. Uh, the main value of the essays that are in this collection, I think, is that they give you a little bit of a background into how I developed my notion of uh, personhood and the person uh, in the earlier study. Um, uh, it, it, um, you know, when you're, when you're writing books and, and, and all of that, you, um, um, you, you don't necessarily have it all mapped out as, you know, like a roadmap or anything. You stumble on things and things occur to you and people say, well, why don't you do this? Or why don't you uh, publish this? And that's how things happen. So I'm very happy that the book is out, and I'm, that's a, a good excuse for us uh, to talk together for an hour or so. All right. Terrific. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, so now we're going to bring in our uh, our guest here, uh, Professor Von Hiking. 
who's uh, got some uh, insightful questions and will engage uh, in some conversation with Professor Walsh. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Brad. And um, thank you also to the organizers for this event for inviting me to uh, get the chance to, to, to talk for a bit with uh, Professor Walsh. So first off, uh, David, congratulations, not only on the publication of this book, but on the broader project that you're working on. I think it's a magnificent project that raises all sorts of questions for us. And for the benefit of our viewers and those tuned in, the, um, Professor Walsh has this wonderful style of writing that is very much in the common sense English tradition, Irish tradition, I guess, um, but it is so luminous and opens up so many questions. So on the one hand, it, it, it almost reads like a novel, but on the other hand, you, you're going to be uh, pausing and thinking and reflecting in, in a most joy, joyous sense. So it's just a wonderful book. And I thought your comment about the, the book, um, the priority of the person as, as kind of given a background may have sort of um, undersold it a little bit. I mean, I think one of the great things about this, this book is that each of the essays in there, on the one hand, can kind of stand alone. So if you want to read what, what Walsh has to say about John Rawls or Alexander Solzhenitsyn or Eric Vogelin or Jacques Maritain or Benedict, ben, Benedict the 16th, you can, you can read those, but they're not simply commentaries. They're, they're, all of these essays are, I guess, kind of what Jacques Maritain calls a whole of holes, all right? They're not simply pieces. Um, so they, they all open up in, in a very luminous way, the things that you, you're doing. Uh, so congratulations to you on that. Um, I thought maybe we could kind of start by kind of, you already kind of answered one of my questions, which is kind of why this category, you know, what or, or who is, is a person? Um, but maybe you could kind of expand on that a little bit and kind of explain why is the person um, a, a better category to, to, to think these things through with than say the more traditional notions like self or soul or ego or, or subject. I mean, they're, they're, it's kind of in competition with, with some, a lot of other terms that people use. The individual is, is another one. So maybe we could start there. Sure, sure. Thanks. Thanks, John. That's, that's a great question to begin with, uh, because it does strike at the heart of uh, the project. Um, and um, uh, one of the essays uh, in, the, in the book does deal with Jack Maritain's book, uh, The Person and the Common Good, uh, which uh, was an essay that he, pub he wrote around 1942 uh, and um, expanded on a little, and uh, the, the English translation is 1966. But uh, the important thing is that he thought at that point, you know, which was really at the, the height of the Second World War, the totalitarian crisis and so on, that really um, we needed to find a way between sort of the collectivism uh, of the totalitarian states, the individualism of what's what are called the liberal um, uh, allied states, uh, and find something in which the individual is not an atomistic member, nor a kind of cog in a wheel in a whole collection of things uh, subor subordinated to the, the collective end. Um, and um, he seized on the, 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 uh, the, the word person, and I think it's an excellent uh, choice uh, because um, the, per the, the word person already puts us directly in contact with others. <clears throat> There's otherness built into it. Uh, interiority, the person is the one who is responsible, who holds his or herself um, you know, in terms of self-determination, self-existence, self-discovery, self-unfolding and self-actualization and so on. And yet it's not isolated. Uh, so uh, all of the, most of those other uh, alternative terms like individuals, that's probably the most, the commonest one. Uh, ego is, uh, tends to be kind of a, a self-interested perspective on things, uh, but, um, you know, the, uh, if you think of, of the individual, the individual suggests that um, you know, we're just units and therefore replaceable, interchangeable, identical. And that's, you know, in many ways how we have to be in social entities, social organization, uh, businesses, collective enterprises, and so on. Uh, but 
at the end of the day, that's not the truth about us. The important thing is that each one of us, not only are we uniquely individual, <clears throat> but we essentially contain a whole world inwardly. The inwardness of each human being is really what's identified by the term person uh, in a far, uh, far more transparent way and in a way that kind of uh, wins you over. Mm -hmm. It's also wonderfully the term that co that's continuous in terms of legal, legal situations. Persons are the ones who are responsible, who are subject to law, who are, you know, uh, rewarded or punished, uh, you know, all of those things. So in a sense, the idea of, of, the, of the person as holding responsibility is almost the only aspect of the word that has sort of uh, been consistently applied. Um, the, the inwardness aspect of the person is a much later uh, deepening of what's there. The, the, the point about its persistence in legal discourse is quite, quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That that for some for some reason, lawyers and, and legal yeah. scholars have, have found that to be very important. I suspect it has something to do with this other regarding aspect built right into the notion of person. Right. Think of the metaphor of the mask. Right. The for the prosopon. Right. Yeah. You, you're you're kind of in the state of presenting yourself, disclosing yourself, but also not. Yeah. 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 So and, it's, it's, and it's, in it's, a sense, you hold others within. Okay. responsibility you know it's that's why it's not really a kind of solipsistic term it's not a subjective yeah. term the term subject obviously subjectivity even john yeah. paul constantly uses the term subjectivity he goes talks yeah. about the subjectivity of society and you know exactly what he means but it's not a happy <laughs> term because it, yeah. it seems to suggest something completely lost inwardly whereas the person is actually reaching out continuously in in continuous you could say self-transcendence towards others and others are in contact with us. And so there's a, um, you could say, um, uh, um, a network of relations embedded in it. Yeah. I, I, one of the uh, interesting uh, things that you talk about in your book is that you have a series of, of you might say, representative persons yeah. who find themselves in situations of political disorder, uh, upheaval and whatnot and have to kind of become exemplary and have to hold uh, the other um, while they're yeah. suffering their, their passion in, in, in a sense. Yeah. Um, I mean, Abraham Lincoln is, is one of those figures that you mentioned. And I remember he writes this letter to, to a friend, he's writing in response, I think it's immediately after the second inaugural where he's, he's responding to the comment that this person makes and, and says, well, you know, you, you're right to point out, you, you know, this, this is um, this, this is a lesson for all. And, and Lincoln says, especially for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, you, you have these moments in the book where, you know, examples like um, Solzhenitsyn talking about uh, Pyotr Stolopin. Yeah. The, 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 he's in the, the kind of Russia's last last best hope before the re revolution. He's kind of taking Russian history, yeah. kind of take be bearing it. So, you know, just as they bear their mask, they bear their person, they bear others. Yeah. And um, another example that you talk about, it's right in the first essay, is uh, Paul Hindemith mm -hmm. and, and his life of Mary. Could you talk about that? Okay. Um, well, that was just sort of uh, uh, Paul Hindemith is is is, is a somewhat um, uh, you know he's well known um, composer of the twentieth century and uh, uh, despised by uh, by the Nazis and so on. Degenerate music and tartatim music he was accused of, and so uh, uh, you know he's a well known guy, but he's he's not everybody's cup of tea. <laughs> and so I kind of came across them uh, by accident um, and uh, started listening and, and exploring it. Uh, and of course, he's a writer of operas as well as other um, um, uh, musical uh, of, uh, song, uh, song cycles and things. Um, and uh, I did come across this song cycle called uh, uh, Das Marienleben uh, based on uh, Rilke's uh, uh, cycle of the same thing. So it ultimately goes back to Rilke. But Obviously, the, the Hindemith responded to the Rilke insights there that, you know, one of the um, things that I think is, was a has been a little overlooked in, say, the story of the Annunciation, 
mm -hmm. uh, is that, uh, you know, you, uh, and again, you know, that's something that's conventionally dealt with in very sort of religious, if not, you know, um, uh, almost liturgical tones. Uh, but um, uh, you have to also look at it from within the perspective of the person. How did it, how did it appear to Mary? Uh, how did the message of the angel appear? And at what point did she um, grasp it? Uh, you know, you realize, yes, all communication, and this is why Lincoln was, is, is so uh, profound a figure and so moving a figure is because he actually gets inside of you. And he's a great uh, um, rhetorician for that reason, like, like St. Augustine. The, you know, the secret of communication is getting, piercing into the other person making that inner connection. It's all about that inwardness. And so there's something in that cycle of poems and in the, and the cycle of songs uh, that sort of culminates at that moment where uh, Mary understands things from the angel's point of view. Seeing things from the other person's point of view is the moment in which you grasp the truth of things or grasp the reality of it. So it was just a nice example of it. Uh, yeah. I've actually since um, uh, uh, started to think a bit more about about that kind of phenomenon, and very much thanks to your own work, John, uh, mm -hmm. on synesthesis in Aristotle, uh, the, uh, where Aristotle deals indeed with this topic of joint perception or joint mm -hmm. consciousness, almost, uh, yeah. which is not too 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 um, I think uh, inaccurate an interpretation to put on it. That this is really where communication occurs, where two people recognize that they actually mean the same thing. They don't obviously have the same mind or the sa exact same yeah. experience, but they're convergent at that point in a way that for both of them, it means, yeah, this is really real. This is much more real than what I was thinking about in isolation yeah. or privately or by yeah. myself, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's that, that, joint, that joint attention that, yeah. that, that, that creates the, the reality. Um, the, the, I, I have a, uh, the Rilke in front of me here. Yeah, okay. And I mean, Rilke was fascinated with the Annunciation. I, mean, I just want yeah. to read a, a couple lines from the chapter in the Life of Mary okay. poem, because yeah. it, it yeah. What really comes out is not only is Mary coming to understand the perspective yeah. of, of the angel, but the angel is quite astonished yeah. that yeah. He has to, yeah. you know, learn yeah. something to, yeah. to get inside yeah. of, of Mary. So, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm skipping over a lot here. But uh, his gaze and the one with which she answered it blended so much suddenly that everything else vanished. And what millions saw, built and endured, crowded inside of her, only her and him, seeing and seen, I and whatever is beautiful to the eye, nor else but right here, this is startling. And it startled them both. Yeah. Then the angel sang his song. I mean, that's just wonderful. Yes, yes. yes. But that, 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 that really gets to that, that mutual comp comprehension. And then there's this moment of, of utter shock or surprise in there. Yeah. And also this notion of, you know, Mary is bearing within her. Um, it's not, I mean, Jesus represents humanity, right? Yeah. Uh, everything, everything that achieved and built. So... Yeah. I mean, I think this, this, this kind of moment of meeting between two persons, you can see this in various points in your discussion of, of some of these historical figures. Um, you kind of have to lay it on the line in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there's a, 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 a wonderful example in, in the movie, The Miracle Maker, uh, okay. about Helen Keller, where uh, I, I don't know if you recall that scene where uh, Helen Keller and um, uh, Anne Sullivan, the teacher, uh, are out in the backyard, and uh, the teacher, uh, Anne Sullivan, is trying to explain to uh, Helen Keller was born, was basically uh, um, uh, blind and deaf, and, and so had no language ability at all um, from a very early age. Uh, uh, and so uh, she's trying to teach her sign language. And the problem is that, you know, you have to be able to communicate in order to communicate sign language. Yeah, so it's, yeah, a, yeah. it's a wonderful example of sort of uh, the problem of communication at the most elementary level. And there's a wonderful breakthrough where she's uh, uh, pumping up the, the water out in the, out in the, in the backyard and uh, uh, she's signing on Helen Keller's hand, W-A-T-E-R, W-A-T-E-R, going over and over. And then all of a sudden, uh, Helen Keller uh, realizes 
that's what she's been doing. <laughs> that these were these these oh, things, yeah. uh, things on my hand mean water. The same thing I'm feeling as well. You know, so it's that moment where joint attention breaks through, and yeah. uh, there there is a kind of, you know. So even communi you know, even understanding what language is, you can't yeah. point to pointing only if you yeah. have all that that moment of a breakthrough. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's a terrific example. That's a terrific example. Yeah. Um, Returning to more overtly political matters, you yeah. have this provocative um, statement in, in one of your, your essays where you write, liberal democracy takes its stand on a principle that departs utterly from any judgment of mundane success. I'm not sure how, how happy a lot of your uh, fellow citizens would, would, would be with that comment, but could you maybe uh, explain that a little bit? What, how do, what's the connection between the person and liberal democracy? Um, well, certainly, uh, if we um, take per persons seriously, we allow them to govern themselves, to decide for their own lives. I mean, that's, of course, uh, the big turning point in the life of any person when they uh, come of age, when they're entitled to make their own decisions. And that includes, of course, making your own mistakes. <laughs> Old parents know that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it has yeah. a kind of unhappy period <laughs> where, where, where you know little Johnny has to go out and, and probably smash up the car and <laughs> learn that no, that's not how you drive it. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it's painful, but you know there's no other way. I mean, obviously, yeah. otherwise the, you remain a parent forever. The, uh, actually, this is John Locke's insight uh, yeah. that yeah. Uh, you know absolute monarchs. Uh, maintain their uh, citizens in a, pay, a state of perpetual tutelage. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, it's yeah. um, that's what's wrong with the paternalistic model uh, of government. It has to be a model of self-government, otherwise it's not a government of persons. Now, yes, as every parent knows, that is a risk. <laughs> <laughs> and you are risking disaster every day. <laughs> right, right. And it's the same with with politics. Every election, yeah. you're, you're 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 courting disaster. You know, yeah. we end up with the exact wrong candidate. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but there isn't an alternative. That yeah. that's really what what that that little comment refers to. So yes, it requires a kind of um, not just a you know people say well you have to have a faith in democracy. But in a sense, you have to have a faith in reality. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the, you know, the, the, um, uh, uh, the text I like to refer to in, the, in, the, in, in that regard is, is the legend of the Grand Inquisitor, where yeah. the Inquisitor explains to Christ after he comes back that we've done much better than you. We've taken away their freedom. So there's no way they can really be unhappy from this point yeah. on. <laughs> and yeah. says, yes, uh, that's the problem. You have to risk them being unhappy, uh, making a disaster, making a complete screw up of everything. Uh, but that, you know, that's the only way through it. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose uh, Christ's response to the Grand Inquisitor is the perfect example, or yeah. the perfect answer in that sense. He just gives him a kiss, he doesn't say, he's silent. And he suffers, Christ suffers. suffers. Yeah. That, you know, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the sinfulness of human nature, the fallenness of, of our condition and so on is, you know, in a sense, God suffers it. So in a sense, the affirmation of what it means to be a person is really a divine um, uh, action or an, yeah. a, a divine endorsement as well, not, yeah. not just a human prediction or anything. So there's yeah. no guarantee democracies will, will work. Uh, but yeah. we, uh, uh, if Christ has faith in it, uh, then we should. Is, is that ultimately the, the answer to the Richard Rorty's or the kind of attempts to justify democracy, say on economic grounds, you know, produces the most wealth, you kind of the secular arguments that no one, no one really seems to believe them anymore in, in a way. Right, yeah. Well, you know, that's all, it's all part of that sort of wider um, uh, inability to understand um, ourselves and our situation politically, personally, individually, and so on, socially, uh, that, you know, nobody really believes that um, uh, the political community is based on some sort of social contract in which you, yeah. you know, put in certain investments and you get certain returns. Uh, no more than we believe that, you know, it's all based on simply, um, uh, you know, uh, an increasing prosperity curve or anything else 
uh, or or just uh, the complete fallibility of human knowledge. Uh, anything, you know, the relativistic argument, any of those things, uh, or indeed the libertarian, the let, let everybody go, go their own way. Those are all kind of um, uh, partial and incomplete uh, statements of uh, that 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 we we use in a certain way to kind of avoid thinking through the deeper bonds and deeper commitments that are actually in place uh, uh, and that ultimately sustain the whole thing, which is that we trust one another, uh, we have a readiness to, to help one another, and we make a kind of unconditional guarantee of um, preserving one another's uh, dignity and worth. Uh, so those are, those are very different from any kind of calculation uh, very different from any prediction about success, or and, and, and certainly uh, way beyond any guarantees of successful outcomes. So yeah. you're ready for the failure in, in that case. Yeah, yeah. Well, that actually sets up the, <laughs> the next thing I wanted to ask you, which sure. is, um, you, you know, you, when one of your, your, I think it's the last essay in, in the in the volume, you you wrote it in response to the 2008 financial crisis. And it, it seems that, you know, liberal democracy and maybe American particular has gone from one crisis to the next. And I suppose um, the, the crisis in social and political trust is, is kind of the big question right now. Um, yeah. Do you have any comments on the, the current state of discontents in, in America? Well, it's a great, a great question, John. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I don't necessarily have answers to any of these. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just agree that they're great questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you know, I, I wrote that essay uh, because uh, uh, my friend John McNerney uh, asked me to. He was chaplain <laughs> to the business school over at the University College Dublin, my alma mater, and uh, <laughs> they had had an even worse financial collapse than anything that had occurred in the U.S. So yeah, uh, yeah he said, "Well, why don't you come over and give us give us a talk about hope." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was but, essentially the product, uh, you know, and, and it gave me an opportunity to think through, um, you know, the way in which, um, uh, you know, these larger virtues sustain a kind of forward movement socially and politically that um, no one can really give an adequate account for, uh, but that, you know, in a sense, we're uh, uh, we cannot abandon at the same time. No, I don't. I don't know where um, uh, the, uh, the, the the social temperature, uh, social and political temperature of American democracy is going. No more than I know where anything else is going. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. there are clearly uh, uh, dynamic changes uh, underway. Um, I'll tell you one of the for me. Uh, one of the important things is always uh, whether there is something comparable to one of these um, ideologies of militant global transformation. And there's nothing like that on the horizon. All we have is just um, a, a, um, uh, a large uh, accumulation of complaints, gripes, frictions, discontents, uh, some justified, some unjustified, and you know, a sorting through of all of those things, uh, not not at I think at a, at a tremendously high level. Uh, and I don't I don't worry about uh, the political dynamics because um, the virtue of liberal democracy is that you can change uh, your political mm -hmm. class, uh, and yeah. so it has a, it has its own built uh, self uh, balancing mechanism uh, yeah. and all of that. Um, now. Um, uh, whether there's uh, 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 whether we've entered a new phase, and uh, the uh, the uh, you know it's it's hard to tell. Uh, the only notable thing, in my from my perspective, is that uh, our political political class seems to be operating in a somewhat different way than it used to. Um, the discontents, uh, the popular uh, upheavals of one type or another. Those are not terribly new. It's how they're addressed by the people who should know better, uh, who have more of a context for judging things, and who, who are committed to taking, who are, you could say, professionally required to take a longer term view, such as political parties. Uh, if they fail to do their job, 
then that's more of a problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Social unrest and social discontent is, you know, a, an everyday feature, I think, of, of, our, of our lives together. There's nothing yeah. perfect in this world, including yeah. uh, the social and political arrangements that we have. Yeah. Well, when I reviewed your, your, that essay, I kept, what kept coming to mind was Augustine's comment in the City of God, where he's telling this Roman audience, well, you know, Rome has been sacked several times in the past, and, yes. you know, Rome and yours. <laughs> well, he was a political scientist, though, so, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he may have been a saint, but he was a political scientist first. Yeah. He, he invented yeah. political science. The science of a realistic view of politics, yes. That's right, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, a lot of political theorists, a lot of commentary has been going on too with this recent phenomenon, you know, colloquially known as woke politics or identity yeah. politics. And, yeah. you know, it seems that that is just shot through and through with the, the, the questions of the person. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, in, and in some ways, um, for some of the the activist types, the, the, there seems to be kind of a, uh, a perhaps a kind of impatience with the sort of hiddenness of the person, and an assertion that no, you need to sort of recognize my mask. I'm, I'm wondering if, if I'm getting that right, but I mean, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the, the current kind of moment of identity politics, woke, BLM, that, that, all that stuff. Um, well, the, the identity side of things um, is, is an interesting thing because, um, you know, that's one of the ways in which, um, you know, we, in a sense, relate to one another as persons. Uh, yeah, we ask yeah. you to take, uh, you know, you, 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 to be a person in, in the full sense means, means to have other people recognize your identity. Uh, mm -hmm. It is that mask or that visi visible visible. Uh, as a self that you present to others. Uh, and so you, you can't be required to conceal it or to uh, set it aside, but um, you know, uh, you also uh, can't impose it on others. So there's a certain negotiation that takes place socially as it does you know, under, under all kinds of, uh, in the family or anywhere else, you know, um, this is how people, uh, you know, are, uh, they deal with the frictions uh, that they impose on one another. And you know that's all. I think uh, an okay uh, kind of mm -hmm. development. Yeah. Um, uh, you know how uh, whether whether your identity is something um, completely uh, variable and changeable is, however, I think um, you know more more problematic. Um, yeah. Because one of the aspects of being a person is that you uh, you don't entirely invent who you are. Right. And so there is a kind of uh, limit to self-creation uh, yeah. because uh, to create yourself, you have to be a self. You have to be somewhere present in the world and have a, a visibility and an identity and so on. So, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we're, not, we're not like blank slates, I think, in that sense. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the effort to negotiate the boundaries of those things is a sort of a natural thing. Uh, but um, you know, uh, negotiation itself uh, has certain presuppositions built into it. So, yeah. I th I, you know, I think that uh, there is a sort of integrity to the idea of the person that ultimately ends up stabilizing the conversation. And especially because uh, we have to take responsibility for one another in this. Yeah. I want to, uh, at this point, yeah. uh, widen our conversation. We have uh, questions that have been submitted, and this was a perfect trans transition because the question that Dr. Von Hiking just asked was the first question that's been submitted that I was going to ask almost identically. Um, <laughs> and so we've, we've, we've done two things at once. Uh, but here's a, a question that was submitted by one of our uh, viewers. Um, it's a little bit complicated, but I think it's quite interesting. He says, um, I'm struggling metaphysically with the notion of the person as prior to existence. Wouldn't it be the case that the person, the singular, unique, rational being doesn't exist before that particular person is expressly created? And after that moment of creation, the person is discovered as a being existing beyond complete comprehension. What do you think of that, uh, David? Uh, no, that's a good one. And uh, it's, not, it's not one that, um, 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 that's unanticipated. <clears throat> um, uh, the only reason I'd, I'd uh, uh, 
push towards the idea that the person is somehow prior uh, to, 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 to all uh, expressions, uh, that the person is there before the, the, the visible presence and so on, is that um, <clears throat> uh, there's, there is, there, there's not only the tradition that um, uh, when uh, a man and a woman uh, generate a child uh, that God is also present uh, in implanting the soul uh, directly. Uh, that, uh, you know, Aristotle, for instance, had the same problem that biologically you can't really explain the generation of, of uh, a, a reasoning creature, a reasonable, a reasoning animal, uh, because it's not part of the biology. That's, that's one sort of footnote to that. Yeah. And so that it's not a totally unknown idea that. Uh, we come from uh, beyond. Uh, we come from God, we come from beyond, and we have a kind of uh, primordial participation in the mode of divine transcendence, not that we're transcendent in the same way. Uh, but, um, you know, it's, uh, there's a dynamic there that is worth while uh, sort of dwelling on. I'm not, I'm not necessarily, you know, not, this isn't an aspect of it that I've uh, fully uh, conceptualized, uh, but I am interested in pursuing it. And that is that when we engage with one another, we engage with another who doesn't really fully grasp uh, who he or she is, just as I don't fully grasp who I am. Uh, and so there is a kind of uh, creativity, a kind of flourishing, a kind of uh, creative, creativeness in the encounter. That's somewhat unprecedented, that it's not predictable, it's not part of um, uh, a routine or a causal account of, of being, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it has all of those unanticipated things that, that every human being is somehow, every person is somehow a new creation and like the beginning of creation. So, you know, once you begin to think, dwell on that unique, um, surprising and unanticipated aspect of every person, which really is the core of what we encounter when we meet one another as persons, that we know that you and I are more than we've been able to say in any encounter, uh, more than we've been able to plumb in terms of the depths. The, the kind of thing that, that Augustine is pointing to where he says we're, we're deeper than we can uh, 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 plumb ourselves, a depth so deep as to be hid from him and whom it is. Uh, we're deeper than we can perceive. All of that suggests the same idea now, all I'm trying to do is to kind of uh, connect that up with our everyday experience of persons, uh, that uh, they flow from um, a, a source that's beyond what we can perceive, beyond what we can identify or, or point to or put our finger on or quantify or anything else. So all of that aspect of the infinity of the person, um, it's not just an abstract thought. It's not just a general principle, it somehow is um, instantiated in real life, in the encounters of real life. That's all I'm doing there. Yeah. Good. Um, here's another uh, very interesting question. Um, do you think the ancient uh, medieval category of substance, since it does imply a discrete and self-subsisting existence, yeah. necessarily yeah. leads to the Cartesian ego or to the atomized individual of liberalism? Um, it can. Um, I think. Uh, I think that's a great question. And um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, when you when you read any of the books about the concept of the person, uh, they all refer back to, as Saint Thomas does, to Boethius's famous definition that the person is a substance of a rational nature. Um, <clears throat> Even the term substance, however, has its difficulties, and especially as it uh, applies to persons. Um, the, um, uh, the difficulty that I have with it, which, you know, in a sense, then it, it, you know, I think the failure to deal with this difficulty does sort of uh, become evident in the later history of modern philosophy, beginning with the Cartesian subject and so on. Subject and substance are closely related to one another as, as term, term, uh, terminologically. Um, uh, and so, uh, the, uh, you know, just to step back from it and ask, 
what's wrong with the, the Boethian definition or this, this notion of the person as a substance, as a continuing entity and so on. There's nothing at one level. I mean, it's a perfectly adequate definition and certainly St. Thomas uh, relies on it and you know, it works up to a certain level. Uh, the point where it doesn't work is where one person gives his life for another. Uh, so in a sense, now you have a substance uh, who is yielding up or sacrificing or offering up his or her substance for another. So you say, well, what is that person? Uh, what is a person then? A person is, is someone who can not, they're not, they're, they're not choosing, choosing suicide. They're not choosing to kill themselves. They are choosing in a sense to go beyond themselves. Well, so they are in some way continuing beyond. So it's a, it's a more um, challenge, you could say it's, it's a more liminal concept than, than we had anticipated. Um, you know, uh, uh, the movie I liked over the last year was, was uh, A Hidden Life about Franz Jägerstädter, the one guy in Austria who refused to serve in Hitler's, uh, Hitler's army. <laughs> and they say, how is it possible for one guy to hold out like that? <laughs> That's what it means to be a person, to be capable of that, you know, and that to be a person is to have that possibility within you. Uh, so it's, he is the substance that you couldn't get rid of, you know. Okay, good. Uh, here, here's a question that refers to, I think, to one of the exchanges between Professor von Hiking uh, and Professor Walsh. Um, it says, Dr. Walsh, how can we recover the Lincoln-esque ability to speak directly to the innermost part of the human being when so many social and political forces today are isolating and dividing humans into identity groups? And I wonder, I mean, I'll just add to that, I mean, because Lincoln came up and I wonder if there are other, let, let us say even perhaps recent political figures, uh, politicians who you think have managed to do something approaching this, if there are any. Uh, yeah, uh, great, great question. Um, I'm not sure again I, that I can really answer it other than, you know, think uh, they must be around. Um, uh, and it's not, uh, it wouldn't surprise me to encounter uh, such figures. Um, I mean, Lincoln is an unusual figure, and most politicians are sort of um, humdrum and every day. Uh, they, you know, uh, do what's predicted and they say very little more about it. Um, and, and even for most of us, we're engaged in a routine range of activities. Uh, obviously, uh, each of us has to do this at, at an individual, at a personal level, because you can't really deal with your children in this way, you can't really deal with your spouse in this way, and you can't really have friends in this way. I mean, that's John's specialty is friendship. Uh, so, <laughs> so yes, in order to be friends, you have to be someone who really manages to get through to someone else. And if, and if you've never got, been able to do that, you haven't really been able to make friends uh, or to have that moment where you glimpse the possibility of friendship. Yes. Um, you know, so it's a, even in terms of just sort of an individual level, it's a, it's a kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, episodic event uh, and it's striking, it's moving, and it's formative for your whole life when it occurs. That's how you fall in love with somebody and you get married to them and you know, all that. Uh, so yes, these are, these are they're the certainly, they're, they're, they're rupturing events. Uh, so to have a public figure who's able to convey something of that. Um, now, uh, that's somewhat more unusual. And, uh, you know, it, 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 you know it's, we certainly can't count on it. Uh, this is why we have, you know, regularly scheduled elections, so that whether we have charismatic li leaders or not, we eventually end up with some sort of leader. Uh, and so we, we carry on and hope for the best. And from time to time, um, you know, uh, the Lord does have, have mercy on us and gives us somebody who manages to communicate and, and lift us up to a higher level. Now, that can also go the other way. You can also have, have, have leaders that um, uh, shift you in a deformed direction and uh, inspire you to give up your personhood, to give up being an individual and just become a mass man uh, and, and raise your, 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 your hand in the salute and so on. So, you know, these are, these are fluctuations or dynamics that we're in a sense subject to and, you know, 
we, we all have to make our own judgments and find our own way. Just as, you know, you could say politically we have to do that and we have to do it uh, interpersonally as well. So you have to decide, you know, who are you going to be friends with and how are you going to cooperate and how are you going to work together and, you know, how are things going to get done? And there is that moment of just illumination uh, that, you know, where two souls connect. Uh, Newman had heart speaks to heart, cor et cor loquitur as his motto. Uh, it's a great motto, uh, you know, that's how, you know, real speaking occurs. That's all you can say that, you know, and we'll, uh, you know, uh, Jägerstater is a, is a classic example of, here's a guy who left us nothing, in, in a sense, you know, was not a public figure at all, but in a certain, so he, you know, he was, his, 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 his witness was preserved and sort of only in recent times sort of come to fruition. And then Terrence Malick wrote, uh, did a, a lovely movie about him. But, you know, none of these are predictable. But you can see that uh, even Jägerstater's almost silent witness, you know, he was in the Tegel prison with uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a really famous guy. Uh, you know, <laughs> there was no one more famous, I think, in, in the Nazi period as a witness than, than Bonhoeffer. Uh, and, uh, you know, yet uh, somehow Jägerstater's uh, thought, his communication managed to percolate out, you know, over the long run. So there is, you know, there's, there's more to be expected than just sort of, you know, what's happened in the last news cycle. Good. Um, so here's another another interesting question, a little bit different. Um, uh, this uh, viewer asks, what happens in the encounter between the person and technology? Can technology ultimately bring the whole of the person to the surface? <laughs> that seems like about about twenty questions embedded in that one. There's <laughs> a lot of distinctions and layers in it. Um, I mean, uh, I guess it somewhat refers to the um, um, maybe that uh, the person can be integrated into a kind of machine-like condition, uh, or uh, you know, be um, you. You can you can upload your mind to a computer or something like that. Uh, you know, yeah, science fiction type things, uh, and uh, and perhaps not so not so fictional. Uh, obviously, technology is part of our lives. It's a part, you know, we're, and and I suspect it's always been there in one way or another. We live in a period of of of, of, of dramatic and rapid uh, transformation by technology. Um, it, it's it's worth. You know, in one sense, uh, the challenges of technology require us to heighten our awareness of what's at stake. And if we think of the integrity of the person as the most crucial uh, centerpiece of all of our frame of reference, <laughs> then obviously technology is something that we have to pay a great deal of attention to. And it also helps us to um, um, uh, be a little clearer about the centrality of personhood. What's the difference between artificial intelligence and real intelligence? Uh, it is personhood. Um, I mean, uh, 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 what do we call him? Turing, the guy who defined artificial intelligence as, you know, putting uh, uh, notes under a doorway and you can't tell the difference between the, whether they come from a computer or from a person. Um, <clears throat> I don't think that's quite uh, uh, a sufficient uh, a definition of it. Um, uh, you know, uh, one of the strange things is that even though artificial intelligence and computers, robots, all of that um, uh, seem to be our competitors and seem to be our main threat, uh, that uh, they can become more and more like us. Um, deep down, uh, they can only mimic us. They cannot provide the real thing. Uh, there was a wonderful movie called She, where a guy is dating a, a computer <laughs> and everything is going on. Everything is going on wonderfully until he discovers that he's also, she's also, the computer is also dating uh, uh, two or 3,000 other guys at the same time. <laughs> uh, and so that, yeah, that, that obviously blows the relationship entirely because uh, you, you can't relate to another as if they're, you know, one of a mass, one of, you know, an interchangeable, uh, uh, collective thing. No, uh, persons are related to only in unique personal ways. And so 
that's why, in fact, we want to uh, meet one another as persons, because even though we can say a lot and we can leave a lot of messages for one another and a lot of emails and everything else, and even Zoom uh, webinars are, you know, only uh, part of the way there, uh, that we, um, uh, you know, still want to get that sense that there's something intangible over and above all that has been said that you only get from meeting in person. And so I think it's a somewhat similar thing. Yeah, good. Uh, so, look, I, I want to ask one last question. We're just we're out of time here, but I noticed uh, I, just looking in the questions, there were a couple of questions about art, and I, I'm provoked by that. I don't know how many people have seen the book. I think we had a picture of it on the advertising, but there's a kind of remarkable uh, piece of art that you put on the cover of the book, and I seem to remember that in your previous book, The Politics of the Person, there's also another very striking image. Yeah, there it is. You have it right there. There you go. I wonder if you, if you want to say you, something. You can uh, call up Notre Dame Press and they'll give you a, a prize for two, you know. Uh. <laughs> good, good. But I wanted to give you a chance to say something, if you want to say yeah, something, sure. about yeah, your yeah. choice of these two pieces. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Brad. Um, well, um, you know, the, the Notre Dame press were very kind and asked me, you know, uh, what I would like on the cover. And I said, well, um, the idea of the person as sort of emerging from invisibility into visibility, I thought has always been captured best by the art of um, um, uh, one of my compatriots, an Irish uh, painter called Louis Le Brocchi. He, you know, uh, he, he lived actually in France most of his years, uh, dead a few years, because a few years ago, but um, he specializes in heads um, and, uh, uh, and the figure. Uh, you know, that's, he, he has other things, but, uh, uh, you know, he has a whole series of heads of famous people and so on uh, that uh, just are remarkable in the sense that when you look at them, you realize, yeah, that's not a true likeness, but somehow the person is emerging out of it. So it's that, it, I, thought, I thought his, his, his paintings, uh, you know, captured that idea of the emergence of the person. And so, but the person is somehow beyond the visible and, he can, and, he, and all of it suggests that. And the, the one on, on the priority book uh, is of a full figure come sort of emerging towards us. Uh, so, you, you know, there, there is the sort of mysterious background and also the process of disclosure at the same time. And again, you know, a, a picture is worth a thousand words. So, you know, it's, I think it's a, a, great, um, a, a great meditation of its own on, on uh, the mystery of the person. That was basically it. Art of yeah. the can do this. And, and uh, John started us off with the, um, uh, the Hindu myth and, and the Rilke uh, poems. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that, that, that has become evident to me is that really art is a superior way of thinking about problems and a more accessible way of thinking about them than discursive philosophical reflection can be. It can be, you know. Yeah, well, that's, that's terrific. Um, uh, David, thank you very much. Um, uh, I think this has been a really wonderful and illuminating conversation. And thank you very much, uh, John von Hiking. Uh, I think, uh, again, a wonderful, uh, wonderful interchange and, and questions between you and, uh, and David. I want to show the, the book again. Uh, you know, you can, you can get it, as uh, David said, and also his previous book uh, to read. And uh, while you're doing that, don't forget to, at some point, listen to Hindemith's uh, Marion Laban, which is the other uh, homework for today. And uh, I put in a plug for the, for the Montester Mahler uh, as well, which I particularly like by, uh, by Hindemith. Right. Um, so, so thanks very much. And I want to thank everyone who's attended today. Um, uh, we invite you to listen to this conversation. If you didn't hear all of it, you can go back and, and you can watch the whole thing and also past events sponsored by the Institute for Human Ecology on our YouTube channel. So please uh, visit our website, ihe.catholic.edu for more events uh, that are there and also uh, information on events that are coming up soon. Our next IHE event will be a collaboration with the National Catholic Bioethics Center on Palliative and Hospice Care from a Catholic perspective. So you can join us for that next Wednesday for that discussion and there's more information about it on the website. So thanks again to David and John and to everyone who's attended and uh, have a wonderful afternoon.
Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank Lovely you. to see you guys, my friends, and and uh, to everybody who, who worked on, on putting this together. Uh, Jessica and Javi, particularly. Thank you.